So I'm going to say Happy Easter. And for those of you that don't like the word Easter, I'm going to say Happy Resurrection Day. All right? Okay? Um, in my mind, they mean the same thing, um, that Jesus is risen. There, there's a tradition in the churches, and uh, Patty up here on the stage earlier uh, uh, led us through it. it. It's a response and an affirmation of the entire fact of the Christian faith. And it comes from a passage in the Bible in Luke 24, depending on your translation, but all of them essentially say this, Luke 24, 34, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. So we have these two banners behind me, and for centuries, Christians have affirmed this fact in a responsive way. So I'm going to say the one uh, on, on the left side, and then you're going to say the one on the right. Okay? Fair enough? You guys ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let that be the uh, full intent of our hearts this morning, uh, the full meditation. And this declaration, as we trace it back to Scripture, was in the context of a couple of guys who had been walking along pretty down in the dumps. And Jesus appeared to them and spent time with them. Now, they were down in the dumps because Jesus had been killed on the cross and he'd been placed in the tomb. But this risen Jesus appeared to them along the road, and they didn't recognize him at first. So we're going to read it together, we'll unpack it a bit, and then you can go home and you can eat your ham and your deviled eggs and, and chocolate rabbits and jelly beans and all that kind of stuff. But before we get to the ham and the deviled eggs and rabbits and beans, let's just let this truth kind of, kind of work on us. So turn in your Bibles to Luke 24, we'll start in verse 13. In your pew Bibles, it should be in the vicinity of page 1643. Um, this is God's Word, this is life, so let's open it together. Verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had taken place. Okay, so these two guys are talking about the crucifixion and all the events in Jerusalem that had happened. Now, some of those that we don't really talk about a lot, because sometimes we don't know exactly what box to put them in, um, but, but there were some bizarre things that happened. The, the sky went dark, dead people were seen walking in the city, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the earth quaked. So they're talking about a lot of stuff there. Verse 15, And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? He stopped just a second. What an ironic question. They're talking, of course, they don't know it's Jesus, but still, I mean, from Jesus' vantage point, this is a really ironic question. So he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now, wait a second. Was it just the leaders calling for his crucifixion? No, no it's an interesting turn that they do there. We won't dive into that much, but, but it's worth some thinking. Uh, verse 21, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that he had also seen a vision of angels, that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. So these guys, they were followers of the earthly Jesus. And they had been looking for this earthly king that was going to kick Rome's tail right out of Judea and restore this political and religious autonomy of the Jews. And when Jesus was killed, that seemed like this is the end. This is it. This is the end of the plan. I mean, it seemed like one big failure. Now, they obviously didn't fully believe this whole resurrection story either. Uh, that the women had gone to the tomb, even though others of their friends had also gone to the tomb and found it empty, just like the women had said. They didn't get to see the angels who were saying Jesus is alive. And, and, and so as they're walking, they appear sad. Their dreams, their hopes, 
mostly rooted in what Jesus could do for them right here on earth, so kind of like the genie in the lamp, all of that was shattered. And then Jesus speaks up. And he said to them, verse 25, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Okay, so just for a second, if if I had to give um, Jesus some advice on preaching, that is not seeker-sensitive. That is just not seeker sent as a preaching right there. And remember, at this point, he just looks like a regular guy to them. He's not glowing. He's not like like high-stepping off the the ground or anything. He doesn't have wings or a halo or any of that. He just looks like a regular guy. So let me ask you, if you came in here today, and and maybe you're on the fence with all of this. Maybe you're watching online, and, 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 and you maybe told me or somebody else what you thought Jesus should be. Like... Uh, because he wasn't what you thought or what you wanted, well, then he must not be real. And then me or whoever you was talking to said, you're kind of dull, aren't you? you? You're a bit slow, aren't you? I mean, at that point, you probably wouldn't even fill out a connection card or anything. I mean, you wouldn't even say, man, I'd like one of those cool mugs or, or any of that stuff. You might even stop payment on your offering check. I know. (laughs) But Jesus is just that bold with them. And it's not because he's mean, but because he cares and he knows and is shown by what he he does next. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses, with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Jesus took the time to open it up with them. He took the time to have the conversation with them. He took the time to remind them of what was true. He took the time, even though he had called them foolish and slow of heart, to explain why he would say that about them. And he started with this larger-than-life figure from Jewish history, namely this Moses guy, another deliverer. And Jesus spent time with them. He didn't tell them to come to church next week to get it from the preacher. He served it up to them right then. And again, remember, he is appearing now as just another traveler leaving Jerusalem. I want to pause just a second here and and talk about our everyone board there in the back. Each light represents a conversation that you have had with somebody about Jesus. Each light has the potential of a person being turned on to the reality of Jesus. You... This congregation are taking the time to have these conversations. Church, you are following the pattern of Jesus in those moments. Isn't that exciting? You are doing this, just like what he did there with these guys along the road. In just about six weeks since we put it back there, you have had over 65 conversations about Jesus with people, so people will come to know him as Lord and Savior. You're doing it. You're doing this pattern. That's amazing. That's awesome. Exactly. So so let's keep looking at this scene here in Luke 24. And and, uh, verse 28, And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he would go farther. So Jesus is acting like he's just going to keep going. And they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. Here's the thing about these two guys. They're soaking up everything that he was teaching them. It was his word that was attracting them to his message, even though they didn't know it was him who was delivering it. Let me say that again, because I I think that can get lost on us. They were soaking up everything that he was teaching them, and it was his word that was attracting them to his message, even though they didn't know it was him who was delivering it. You see, it wasn't personality. It wasn't a gimmick. It was just the message. I take a lot of comfort in that. If you've been around me for a while to hear me speak, I think you figured out that I want to follow this pattern. Uh, My my ability or my safety, my security, my effectiveness, all of it is in this pattern. Read God's Word, know it best I can through study and experience, and talk about what it says and then what that means for us. That's my secret sauce to preaching and teaching. That's not why I'll I'll never have a million-seller book because it'd have like, like three sentences in it. That, that, that's, that's how not so clever I am. 
but it's because the power of this message happens in the living pages of this word. That's where the power of anything that the church has, that, that's where it's at. That's the horsepower. It's in Jesus and Him risen. So Jesus has them absolutely, He's got them engaged with His word, His message. They want to hear more. So He goes into shelter with them, a house or an inn or something, we aren't really told. And then in verse 30, And it came about that when He had reclined at the table with them, He took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, He began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Now, here's the thing. I don't think that this is some kind of random moment, a a, a coincidence. It's too precise for that. Jesus, in this moment, is recreating a moment he had experienced with his disciples before he was arrested. You see, when Jesus had done that just a few days prior, he was revealing to his disciples one more time in a very tangible way that he is the Savior. He was revealing the new agreement that God was making with mankind, the new covenant, we sometimes call it in church circles. It was in that moment a few days earlier that Jesus took bread and told them that it represented his body that was going to be broken for them, and by extension for us. And then he had them eat it. He had them take it in. He had them to literally chew on this truth that Jesus had come to sacrifice himself for the sins of people, for them, for us. And it would hurt. It it would cost him his life. And at that same meal a few days earlier with his disciples, he took a cup of wine and said it represented the blood of the new agreement, the new covenant. And it can seem kind of strange I mean, the whole concept of blood, oaths, or covenants. But if we go all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God killed a couple of animals and He took their skins. He shed their blood to make clothes for Adam and Eve. It was to cover them after they had sinned for that first time. If you're going to ratify an agreement... You know, oftentimes what we ratify is with a, with a promise or, or uh, maybe, maybe uh, several hundred years ago, I would pay you this much gold or this much silver. But what's the most precious thing you could possibly ratify an agreement with? It's blood. Um, I, I wasn't going to put this in here, but I got it. When I was a kid, you'd watch the old westerns and, and the guys would go, with a knife, and the other guy would go with a knife, and then they would shake hands, and they were blood brothers. And I got to researching that, and there were, there were cultures that you were only allowed to have maybe one or two blood brothers. And I don't think that was because you might get into the tendons. I think it was because this was such a deep and intimate oath. You were mingling something here that, that was going to be like a forever like, kind of thing. So in this moment with his disciples, a few days prior to this walk on the road, Jesus told him that that this was it. This was the last sacrifice. He was going to be the sacrifice. He was going to be the coverings for sin. He was going to be the last one ever needed. That's the gist of the moment we have happening here with these two guys that the risen Jesus has been walking and talking with and teaching. So so there's this moment recreated. Let me read those verses again. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. What if our communion time every week was just like that? Like, Like if each week as we broke bread together, we really finally recognized him as the risen Savior. And I don't mean just on the surface, but like, but like realizing it for the first time all over again. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't our, I, I think it would change our lives. I think it's supposed to change our lives. And what happened next? I, I, I love this moment. Verse 32, Luke 24, 32. This is a great verse to memorize. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Now remember what scriptures he's talking about, Okay. Imagine somebody sitting you down and going through the Old Testament writings with you. If you've ever even been in your Old Testament. A lot of folks, they they kind of shy away from it. 
telling you about this, this Messiah, this deliverer, this anointed one that's coming, this Jesus, and, and how all of that happened there in the Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. It was ground zero for that moment that for hundreds of years had been talked about, but it was going to happen in a moment. And they had experienced the moment. Would that make your heart burn? Maybe, right? I mean, well, you know, Moses did this, and then there was this tabernacle, and, and there were all these things in the tabernacle, and this meant this, and that meant that, and this other thing meant that. I mean, it's a little overwhelming. Now, these guys had some background with that, being Jewish fellas, but still, it's instructive to think, would his word, would his message really make my heart burn? I thought of this little nugget while I was thinking about my own experience. I thought myself pretty clever here um, with, with this resurrection account of Jesus and this story in particular and even the connection with the Old Testament writings that can sometimes be a little bit hard to understand. The heart burns with a passion that the mind can't always comprehend. The heart burns with a passion that the mind can't always comprehend. I can't imagine that all of their mental faculties were, were all, all figured out at this point when they realized who this was that had been with them. They've had the information, but, but we're not talking about information anymore. We're talking about transformation. And transformation really isn't one of those mind things because we're pretty weak as people, right? Our wills are pretty messed up. We chase all kinds of crazy stuff with our lives. Their hearts, not the pumps in their chest, but the spiritual deeper part of them, their true faculties beyond their five senses, beyond their experiences, were telling them that this moment was a true reality moment, contrary to their earthbound way of thinking about life and death. I mean, dead guys just don't appear to you and walk with you and talk with you. Their hearts were telling them that this was more than wounds in the hands and feet and a spear in the side and a stopped heart and a buried body. Their hearts were telling them that this went way beyond a dead moral teacher or even a gifted miracle worker, no matter how good they might have thought he was. This, this moment was well beyond that. This burning of their hearts that was the most important part of them, the eternal part of them, reacting to the Creator God who had placed that spirit in them in the first place. This was a communion with eternity right there. And then Jesus disappears from their physical presence when they have this very spiritual reality check. So what do they do next? I mean, what do you do next? What do you do with a mountaintop spiritual experience like that? What do you do when confronted with a fantastic reality that makes it all true? What do you do? Verse 33, and they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Hallelujah, he is risen. That's what they did. Okay, so the English here is a little confusing on the second part of that with, with the whole appeared to Simon thing, but we'll get to that. The first part, though. So what they do with their mountaintop spiritual experience with Jesus is that they seek people out to share it with. Their friends that they had only earlier in the day parted ways from, and some of them were saying stuff that they didn't understand. And, and these two guys obviously had, didn't believe it, and they'd walked away sad. That moment when, just, when Jesus disappears from their physical eyes, though, is the moment that they head back to Jerusalem and, and it probably wasn't the best time to travel. It was probably likely dark out at that point. Uh, n not, a, not a great thing. And it, and it probably took them a few hours to get back to Jerusalem from Emmaus because it's a seven-mile walk. So these guys, in seeking out other people, they did what I think is the normal reaction to the miraculous news that Jesus really is alive. They met up with other people who had come to this same truth. When we really believe this, it brings us together. I mean, is Jesus raising from the dead 2,000 years ago any less miraculous news now than when it first happened? I don't think it's less miraculous. Does it mean any less now than when it first happened? I don't think it means less. Now, that's not to beat any of us up over this, but, I mean, but, but one of the reasons we take communion together every week here at ARCC is because we do believe that He rose from the dead, that He is the Savior, and we want to do this together, to figure this all out together and, and what it means and share it with other people. 
here's what's interesting. There, there is a religious or a moralistic approach to all this. It says, I, and, and statistics bear this out, uh, uh, the, the George Barna certif- uh, statistics, not certificates, statistics um, bear this out. Here's what a lot of people do with church, with gathering with God's people. I show up once in a while to feel better about myself. Like, like I'm a little more moral because I came to a church service. I'm, I'm a little less bad than I was. And well, any of the bad stuff, God's just going to have to forgive that for anyway, right? A lot of people treat the gathering of what, what is talked about in the New Testament, the gathering of the saints, they treat it like that. But it's the wrong approach. Because this isn't about your morals. This is about your destination. This is about your transformation. Because when the reality of Jesus really gets into us, when it gets to us at our most intimate and real and raw selves, it changes things. It reorders things. It changes our priorities and what we think of as important. It's the kind of thing that takes us out of religion and into relationship. It, it's the kind of thing that draws us to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbors, our friends, other people, everyone, as much as we love ourselves. It's the kind of thing that makes us live out and explore and discover our very real and personal faith in a very communal way, in community with other people. I really believe when we, we read the New Testament, when we look at the early church, even the church through the centuries, it, it, get, getting up to our time, I, I think when we look at our time, we see love has grown cold, which is what Paul wrote to Timothy, that this would happen. But the natural reaction, if this is real, is for us to be together. It, it, the natural reaction to the, the relational aspect of waking up to the reality of Jesus and the fact that that he is alive, is to be together. They, they spend time with other folks who have shared in this news that Jesus is alive. So they, they travel the seven miles on foot to get back to the others. How many of you walked uh, seven miles to get here today? I mean, praise God, if you did. You know, in, in some parts of the world, that is happening. So, so when they get there, they, they find the disciples talking among themselves Uh, Verse 34 again, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And what verse 34 means is that they found the disciples saying the same thing that these two had just experienced also, namely that Jesus was alive and had also appeared to Simon, who was also called Peter. It would have been like our opening moment here, all gathered together saying, He is risen, like the disciples all gathered together, excited but scared, in the dark, afraid of the Jews, not sure what's coming next, probably afraid of the Romans too, and, and so these two guys show up, and everybody there is saying, he is arisen, he, he's appeared to Simon. And these two guys would have been this side of it. They'd have been like, he is risen indeed. We just saw him. And then he was gone. And these guys who had been on the road to Emmaus, can you imagine? And they began, verse 35, to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. So maybe you're, you're tuning in online or you're sitting here today and you're on the fence about all this. I get it. I, I, I really do. There are, there are a lot of talking points. And given any kind of an intellectually honest investigation, those talking points are actually pretty shallow sound bites. Shallow sound bites that try to refute all of this, all of what I've just relayed to you. There's so many out there that said it didn't happen, couldn't have happened. But in my experience, there are ample pieces of evidence and lines of thought that, that with my law enforcement background, my theological training, my science training in college, I'm pretty confident that I could walk you through the case of the resurrection. And if you didn't like what I had to say, you could, you could read any number of books where people have done that. Many of them coming from a point of atheism to have found that Jesus really is true. But I come to you here today not using any of those. My appeal to you to do something with the risen Jesus is not dependent on any of that because proof really hasn't ever been the issue. Think about it. The most powerful government in the world at the time Jesus was killed was guarding the tomb of this dead rabbi that most of the religious leaders didn't even like 
and had wanted dead. And the remaining followers of this dead rabbi had scattered like cockroaches when Jesus was killed on the cross. And he was killed on the cross by professional executioners. All they had to do to kill this whole movement to where we wouldn't be sitting here today was to produce a body. That's all they had to do. Rome or the Jewish leaders, either one, all it took to squash the whole thing was a body. But they couldn't because there wasn't one to produce. And in a letter the Apostle Paul wrote later, he mentions over 500 people that the risen Jesus had appeared to at one time. Not 500 total, but like 500 all at once. And that most of them, when Paul writes this letter, are still around to fact check this whole thing. People through the centuries, those first believers were persecuted and many of them lost everything. Many of them were killed for their profession of faith in the risen Jesus. Regular people who had regular lives and regular families and regular jobs were willing to give up every bit of it for Jesus to be made known to others. Regular people don't normally die for a lie. If it hadn't been true, this story of Jesus there very early on would have been proven as such very early on, within hours or days or weeks of his death. There's lots of theories. Theories like uh, mass hallucination have been put forth. Uh, the, the, there's swoon theories where he wasn't really dead by these professional executioners. Modern theories of all kinds of stuff, really. And they've been disproven by some of the smartest medical folks and psychological folks from all different walks of life and over long periods of time. But it's just never really been about the proof. And even if you're on the fence, it's not really your head that needs the convincing. It's your heart and your will. The human part of us is pretty stubborn like that. So do you remember what Jesus tells those guys when, when they're walking along before he shows them he's Jesus? He says, verse 25, he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. This word for foolish in the Greek really has some deeper meaning than just foolish. It's more like you can't see the past the end of your nose, so you're only thinking about stuff that your five senses can grasp. So what Jesus is getting them to collide with here is a spiritual reality. And the slow of heart idea in the Greek is literally dull to trust. It's the weird position of knowing that there's a faith position present, but you're failing to grasp its reality or its importance. So why don't people trust Jesus, really? I, I mean, deep down, we're designed with the capacity for faith to trust what we can't see. We do it all the time. We do it every day. I think, if I had to answer that question for me, it's because we want to be the masters of ourselves. To, to, to think what we want to think and do what we want to do and live how we want to live. And anything that would challenge any of that notion, like, like how could I be wrong? Well, that challenges my sovereignty. That challenges me getting to be the boss of me. One of Jesus' best friends wrote this account of a conversation Jesus had with a religious leader named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he didn't want the other religious guys seeing him to go uh, to Jesus to find out about him. And here's, I, I want to read a little bit of the conversation. It's in John chapter 3. Some of it might sound familiar. So here's what Jesus says about himself. And this is early in his ministry. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Rich, why don't you and the band come on back up. This morning... I really do hope your heart is burning in you because if this is true, it really does change everything. Not just for two guys 2,000 years ago taking a walk with Jesus, but you and me right here, right now. So if you believe this, what do you do with it? 
The shortest gospel sermon we ever find is just a few words, and Jesus preaches it in Matthew 4, 17. It goes something like this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're like, why couldn't you just preach that sermon? Could have already been to the ham and deviled eggs and all that. Jesus says, change your mind, change your life, wrap yourself up in this reality that Jesus is here, that he is alive, that he is the kingdom, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the person and means by which God pours out his love and his grace and mercy and forgiveness on us. All of us have sinned and missed the mark. None of us can stand before God someday on our own and say, yep, I was pretty much perfect. I, I did more good than bad, I think, so, so you need to just let me on in there, if you please. I appreciate you knocking off the rough edges. There, there's no scales. There's no weighing it out, because Jesus didn't come and die and rise again, then somehow leave it up to you to keep track of some cosmic scale. You can't. He didn't come to make bad people into good people. He came and did all of that for you and me because without him, we are just simply dead with a pulse. A short-term moment of life with an opportunity to grab hold of a forever life. And without him, we are what the Bible calls dead in our sins. We really are literally dead with a pulse. Today, because of what Jesus did, because he lives today, because he rose from the grave after dying on the cross, because of all of that, you can have eternal life. Will you give him your life today? When the people that Peter preached to a few weeks after Jesus ascended into heaven heard this message, and they were convinced of its truth, the Bible says in Acts 2 that they were pricked in their hearts. So we've got burning hearts, we've got pricked hearts, something's happening in the heart, right? And they asked Peter and the other disciples what they had to do to be saved. And Peter had a simple answer. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, change your mind and your heart about this truth. Go underwater as a symbol of bearing that old self. Let Jesus cleanse you from your sin, and you'll receive this precious gift of the Holy Spirit living in you and with you, abiding in you forever. You will be free. So, if you want that this morning, then I want to invite you to come up and, and let's talk through it. The, the, the ham's going to wait a little bit longer. The deviled eggs are in the fridge. They're not going to go bad. The chocolate rabbits aren't going to melt or hop away or anything. The thing is, you have to do something with this truth that He is risen. He is risen indeed. And if you aren't ready yet to follow Jesus, but something is stirring in you about this, then at least give yourself every opportunity to figure this out. Don't listen to the talking points. Study the Bible, and if you want to, I'll study it with you. I know the people here at American River Community Church will be happy to study it with you. And if they're not, come tell me. <laughs> this is, truly, this is the most important truth you will ever be confronted with. So let's stand up. I'll pray. And if you want to follow him today, please just come up during the song and we'll have a brief conversation about your next steps. We'll pray together and take those next steps together. If it's to be baptized, everything's ready for that. If it's to explore it more, we'll figure that out too. Just if you've not made a decision about this today, no decision is a decision. Let's, let's have a conversation. Let me pray. God, I thank you today that your message is as powerful now as it ever was. And we live in a time where love has grown cold towards you. God, where you're no longer seen as an authority. Your, your word is no longer seen as an authority. The church is no longer seen as an authority. And every time that has happened, you have lit a fire of revival. Lord, we don't come from a position of political strength or, or even moral strength or, or any kind of other strength. We come from a position of your strength, your message, God, your truth. Help us to be people about that. And Lord, I pray if there are people in here this morning or watching online that have not made a decision about what, what they're going to do with that truth, I, I pray that they understand that they're dead with a pulse. But you... Just as you arose from the grave, Jesus, you bring us to life. You raise us up out of sin and out of death and out of darkness to walk in light 
and freedom and righteousness. We love you that that our holiness doesn't depend on us. It, It depends completely on you. That you have set us apart as a people for yourself. That you have adopted us as your sons and daughters. That you're going to take us home someday to live forever. That's where our hope is. And you're so worth it, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you burn in hearts this morning. That you prick hearts this morning. And you turn our eyes and open our eyes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.